Well, that was the single worst call in NHL playoff history. But that's not what lost the Oilers the game. What cost the Oilers game one of the Western Conference Finals against the Colorado Avalanche? We'll get into that and much more on today's episode of Locked On Oilers. Your Locked On Oilers, your daily podcast on the Edmonton Oilers. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome back to the Locked On Oilers podcast. I am your host and former Oilers game day producer, Brett Holden. Thank you so much for joining us on this wonderful, wonderful Wednesday. Even though Tuesday could have been better as game one of the Western Conference Finals went down in weirdly exactly the way a lot of people thought it would in a lot of different ways as the Edmonton Oilers couldn't quite pull off game one for the third straight series in these playoffs. What went wrong for the Oilers? What can they do in game two in the rest of the series to actually have some success going down the line? We will get into that plus the good, the bad, and the ugly from game one, including that Ugly, 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 ugly. And did I mention ugly offside review in the first period? That, again, worst thing I've ever seen in my life. A worst thing I've ever seen in my life. Also, just before we get into today's episode, we do want to thank the people, the great guys, Chris and Kyle over at Locked on Avalanche. If you haven't had the chance already to go and say hi to the uh, Locked on Avalanche guys over there, Guys, we have had wonderful conversations with Sarah from Locked On Kings, Jess from Locked On Flames, but those two at Locked On Avalanche are just some of the greatest people you will ever met. So ever meet. So we are in for a very long series between the Oilers and the Avalanche. So go and say hi to them over there. But here at Locked On Oilers, thank you so much for making Locked On Oilers your first listen every day. We are free and available wherever. You find your podcast. (sighs) Well, game one didn't go the way the Oilers wanted, and a lot of Oilers fans wanted either as eight to six is the final score between the Edmonton Oilers and the Colorado Avalanche. Wow. Wow. Uh, I, I mentioned that it was kind of how a lot of people expected the game to go in regards to entertainment value, and that's exactly what you got. Entertainment as the Edmonton Oilers. We were one goal away from having the exact same scoreline as the Edmonton Oilers did in game one of the Cal- or Calgary Flames series. See, I'm trying to get away from saying Calgary Flames, and that we just and yet we just wrap ourselves back into that series. But yes, eight to six, the final score in depth. Denver, Colorado in game one. <sighs> Mike Smith gets pulled. Miko Koskinen comes in for the Oilers. Darcy Kemper gets pulled because of an injury, not because of any uh, performance issues as Pavel Francouz comes in. We're not sure who the Oilers are going to get in game two. So let's get into the things that the Oilers just did poorly and why the Edmonton Oilers lost game one. One as there is a plethora of things as uh, I normally have about I, I'm going to show you a little bit of my notes without spoiling too much, but I normally have about three points or three talking points that I'll kind of brush over at some point in my notes. Yeah, today I have much more than that. Okay, I have about six that we need to get to because the Edmonton Oilers did a lot of things very, very, very poorly in game one, basically to the point where I'm sitting here in the second period and going, man, I'm done watching this. Like this, the there was no point in inside me at least did I think the Oilers were going to be able to to come back. They did bring it within one, and that's great. You know, that's that's the team that a lot of people expect from the Oilers. They know that the Oilers have resiliency no matter what, and we talked about that before. But there just didn't seem like there was a lot going for the Oilers. So what went wrong? It started with the first goal of the game. 
somehow Evander Kane comes in on a transitional play on a breakaway and scores and makes it one nothing for the Oilers. And honestly, in the exact same shift, he made an awful turnover that the I was surprised that the Colorado Avalanche didn't score on in the first place. A couple seconds later, turnover for the Oilers, and it's one nothing for the Oilers. However, the Oilers only had a lead in game one for 36 seconds. As the Colorado Avalanche are able to come back and score 30 seconds, 36 seconds later, and then they score once again to take the lead, and it really seemed like that was kind of where the game was going to head. It kind of seemed like it was going to be a blowout for the Colorado Avalanche. Zach Hyman was able to score in the last 22 seconds of the thir- first period, excuse me. But as we all know, Kale McCarr scores in... I'm going to say it, and I'll leave my long rant to the end here, but that was the worst call in Stanley Cup playoffs history. I understand technically it's the rule, but it was bad, and that is why, and again, I, I mentioned it's not exactly what caused the Oilers to lose, but, I mean, the Oilers are going into the second period just scoring a goal, with 22 seconds left in the game, or in the the period, excuse me, they're going to go in with a tie game going into the second period, in a period that they had no business in being tied going into the second. No business. They were run all over by the Colorado Avalanche, and the fact that the others were able to tie it up at the end of the period was nice. But nine seconds later, the Avalanche take a lead, and there you go. Is the Avalanche are up again. And the exact same spot it seemed like the Oilers were in going into the second period is a different ball game. 36 seconds the Oilers played with the lead. The Oilers need to play with much more than that if they want to win this series and head off to the Stanley Cup final. The second thing that really went wrong for the Edmonton Oilers in game one Connor McDavid, Leon Dreisaitl, and take your pick of whichever Zach Hyman or Evander Kane that came out next to those two didn't really get anything going. In fact, for the first period on basically every shift that Connor McDavid and Leon Dreisaitl were out for, they were pinned in their own defensive end. Well, you can't really score your 26th, 27th, 28th, 29th, 30th, 34th, 35th. I just jumped from 30 to 34. You can tell how good I am at math, but you can't score that many goals when you're in your own end. or as many points even. When you're in your own end, unless you're Rasmus Anderson and Mike Smith is in that. Sorry, sorry, I had to go there. But there was just nothing going for the Oilers and Connor McDavid and Leon Dreisaitl at the start of the game. And that is where the Oilers' offense gets started. I mean, you don't need a rocket science scientist or basically the smartest hockey mind ever to tell you that the Oilers' offense starts and ends with 97 and 29. So if they can't even get started, the Oilers' offense can't even end if it's not even, like I said, started. And Connor McDavid and Leon Dreisaitl just had nothing going in that first period. And second period, if I'm going to be honest with you. It wasn't until the third period where we were kind of finally like, oh, okay, so they can play against each other. So what's going on here? Uh, The other thing, oh my goodness, the Edmonton Oilers were second to each and every single puck in the first 40 minutes. Every puck. There was no hustle from anybody on that team, on the wings, on the end boards, on the backboards, on the sideboards, to a free puck in the middle of the ice. Nobody. In the first 40 minutes, the Edmonton Oilers were beat to each and every single puck, and they lost the game because of it. They had no compete level. No compete level. No compete level. The Colorado Avalanche just played a game a couple days ago. They're ready to play. The Edmonton Oilers were not. And that was evident in the first 40 minutes to each and every loose puck. They were just giving up possession. They were just skating backwards and letting the Colorado Avalanche take it to them. You're not going to win hockey games like that, especially when you're a team who prides themselves 
on having speed, on being the first of those pucks, on beating those guys after the pucks to go in, into their own end. And then you go, okay, bye. See you later. The Colorado Avalanche did that to you. And they ended up scoring eight goals because of it. They got to be better with that. They got to be better. On top of that, the reason why the Oilers are also losing is because when they are second to the puck, the Colorado Avalanche have all the possession. And they just play with the puck below the goal line, below the faceoff dots. And they are a fantastic cycling team. And every time the Oilers would be the first to the puck, they wouldn't know how to get it out of the zone. They, they, they had like 11 minutes of offensive zone time in the first period, basically, in the first 25 minutes of the game. There was a stretch of the first period where the, the Colorado Avalanche could not not be in the Oilers zone and could not not have the puck on their, on their stick. Every single time the Oilers went to clear the zone, it just dinked right onto another a Colorado Avalanche player, and they did nothing about it. They retreated and let the Avalanche do whatever the Avalanche wanted. And, well, we saw three times in the first period the puck went into the back of the Oilers' net. There was no compete level. There was no hustle from the Edmonton Oilers in their own defensive end. And they couldn't even figure out how to get into the offensive zone of the Colorado Avalanche. They were stood up at the Colorado Avalanche blue line each and every single time they tried to bring the puck in in the first period. And it, 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 was, it, was, it was like, you shall not pass. And they did it. They had no idea how to gain the zone. They had no idea how to get the puck out of the zone. And that cost the Oilers. Those are things the Oilers need to work on as well. Plus, the last thing I will bring up on why the Oilers lost, three names. And I hate to throw people under the bus. I, I, I really do hate to throw people under the bus because realistically they are the ones in the NHL and I'm the one who's sitting here talking to you on your nice commute over to your work at six in the morning. And if you're not, and if you're in the shower, hello, nice, nice, nice talking to you. But Darnell Nurse, Duncan Keith, and Evan Bouchard need to be better for the Edmonton Oilers. They were the three worst players on the ice at any given time for the Edmonton Oilers, and they did cost the Oilers a, the game, really. So they need to be better. And again, like I said, I hate throwing people under the bus because realistically, <laughs> they're the ones there in Denver, Colorado right now, and I'm the one here in front of a camera talking about game one in Denver, Colorado. But... There are, of course, seven potential games that can be played in a series, and you got to win four. You don't win the series with one. So what do the Oilers need to do in game two, and what do they need to work on from game one to have success in the rest of the series? We'll get to that in just a second. But first, I want to tell you about one of our partners, Rock Auto. This episode is brought to you by Rock Auto. With the ever-increasing numbers of makes and models, it is now impossible for you to get your, for your local chain rather, to have all of the auto parts stocked and all the parts that you need in stock as well. So why endure often pointless and genuinely intimidating questioning like, is your Odyssey an LX or an EX? And wait while the person behind the counter orders the parts on their computer, choosing the only parts and only brand that their warehouse happens to carry. When you have computers with access to rockauto.com at home and in your pocket. Why choose to spend 30, 50, and even 100% more for the same parts from a chain store or a car dealership? For example, that exact same Honda, uh, Honda Odyssey that we were talking about, a gas pump from your local chain store can be $353. Now, Rock Auto, $200. And 16. Save time and money while using Rock Auto. Plus, Rock Auto is a family business serving do it yourselfers for over 20 
years. Go to rockauto.com right now and see all the parts they have available for your car or truck. Right locked on in their how did you hear about us box so they know who sent you. Amazing selection, reliably low prices, all the parts your car will ever need. Rockauto.com. Wow. When uh, just before we move on here, we have an important favor to ask of you, the listener. We put together a survey so we can learn more about our listeners, just like you, and make your favorite Locked On podcast even better. This is your opportunity to tell us what you want, and uh, and what we can do to make the podcast even better. You can head to lockedonpodcast.com slash survey right now to get started. It won't take very long and everyone that completes a survey can qualify for a chance to win one of 10 $100 Ticketmaster gift cards. To take your audience to the new level, go to uh, Locked On Podcast and take the audience survey. Head to LockedOnPodcast.com slash survey. Thank you so much for the help, guys. Oh, I want to know what I can do to make your day and more enjoyable, and hopefully it's not talking about an Edmonton Oilers loss. I'm sorry about that. So what can the Oilers do better? What can they be better at? in this series because there are stuff that you know what obviously at one point the Oilers almost came back and tied it so they were obviously doing something right realistically when you take a look at it Colorado Avalanche allowed six goals in game one so that's the same amount of goals that the Calgary Flames allowed in game one against the Edmonton Oilers Not bad. Not bad. So the first thing that the Oilers can be better at in game two, you can't allow a touchdown a game. And that's that that is straight from the source of Mike Smith. You can't allow a touchdown a game. You're not going to win if you're going to allow seven. Unless you're going to score eight. And the Oilers haven't scored eight yet. They scored six a couple times. They got to stop allowing that touchdown and the extra point. In fact, the Colorado Avalanche went and scored not only the extra point, but they went for two, and they got it. The Oilers have to cut down on the chances. They got to figure out that this goes with, and this is another thing that the Oilers need to figure out, is how to exit the zone. (laughs) Again, the Edmonton Oilers, especially in the first two periods, had no idea on how to get the Colorado Avalanche out of their end. They just had no clue. They could not do it. And they had sustained pressure. It was just a matter of time. Each and every time the Colorado Avalanche had the puck in the Oilers' end on when they were going to score. You got to get the puck out of the zone and you can't be allowing a touchdown a game because that's how that ends up happening. Plus, the Edmonton Oilers got to shoot the puck more. Hello, like we said, six goals for, or six goals against, I guess, for the Colorado Avalanche, six goals for, for the Edmonton Oilers. In game one, Darcy Kemper had an 8-12 save percentage. Now, he did only play half the game, but Pavel Francouz, an 8-57 save percentage. So if the Oilers just keep shooting the puck, Hello, we were saying the exact same thing against the Calgary Flames. And then look what happened. Jacob Markstrom looked like a pedestrian just thrown on with some, some, some pads on him. He just looked like some Joe Schmo off the side of the street who happens to be six foot four and can kind of play goaltender. But the Edmonton Oilers really took advantage of that. In game one, Pavel Francouz and Darcy Kemper both had save percentages under 860. The Oilers scored six goals. This isn't, again, this isn't rocket science. Shoot the puck. If you're not allowing a touchdown per game and you're trying kind of figuring out how to get the puck out of your zone and you're getting shots and scoring six goals a game, that's a recipe for success right there. And that 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 that's against any team, not just a team that you just played against, who happens to be one of the best in the league, 
who happens to have a Vesna Canada goaltender in Darcy Kemper. It, it's, it's exactly what you need. And the Edmonton Oilers can do that. And if the Edmonton Oilers can continue to do that and make sure that they don't allow those six plus goals, they're going to win some games. <laughs> they will. They will. I'm telling you, they will. Plus, the final thing that the Edmonton Oilers need to do better heading into game two and the rest of the series is to keep a lead. 36 seconds of a lead in game one is not going to win you any game. Not just game one, it's not going to win you game two, game three, or game four. And after four, you lost. You might as well pack your bags and start booking your tea time at Vic downtown because you aren't going to be playing hockey in the next round. So the three, three and a half, let's call it four things that the Edmonton Oilers need to do better in game four, or in game two rather, to have success. Not only in game two, but throughout the rest of the series. You can't allow a touchdown per game. They got to shoot the puck more. They got to figure out how to get the puck out of the zone. And finally, you can't have a 36-second lead. You got to keep a lead. Now, let's get into the good, the bad, and the ugly from game one. Not only for the Edmonton Oilers, but the game as a whole. In just a second, but first, let me tell you about our partners at Bet Online as they continue to be the number one source for all your betting needs and sports information. Find all the latest odds, news, and sports developments, including this year's NHL hockey playoffs. You can also get the QMJHL playoffs, as we mentioned with just before. You can bet on the Shawinigan Cataracts and Edmonton Oilers draft prospect Xavier Borgo as he and the Shawinigan Cataracts are a win away from the QMJHL finals. And that game goes tonight. So make sure you take a look at those lines there because, hey, Xavier Borgo has scored a couple game winners for Shawinigan so far in these playoffs. <laughs> Not saying he might do it again. But you might want to take a look at those lines. Plus, Major League Baseball is in full swing as well. The NBA Finals is going uh, right away here. And the NFL season is right around the corner, too. Bet Online is your continued source for all your sporting wagering information from live betting to playoffs, esports, and much more. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends and action. Bet Online where the game starts. All righty, let's get into the good, the bad, and the ugly from game one. <laughs> let's be real here. There was a little bit of everything in game one. Let's take a breath for a second, everybody, as it is a wonderful Wednesday. Take a, take a sip of water, stay hydrated. <sighs> okay. Let's move on to the good, the bad, and the ugly from game one. Is let's start off with the good. Let's let's have some sort of positivity on today's episode. As the good for the Edmonton Oilers was they actually had a gutsy performance. Yes, they were down at numerous times. In fact, at one point they were down seven to three. Well, then became seven to six, and the Oilers were just that close. That close from tying the game, but they couldn't. And the Edmonton Oilers were getting goals from people other named other than Connor McDavid and Leon Dreisaitl. Connor McDavid did get a goal, of course, but Evander Kane with the goal and an assist for two points. Zach Hyman with a goal in his sixth straight game for the Oilers. Ryan McLeod getting on the score sheet, as we mentioned with the guys from Locked On Avalanche. Ryan McLeod, he deserves one, and oh. Oh, I can't tell you how happy I was for that kid, man. He needed that goal. He needed that. Ryan McLeod also getting on the score sheet. Connor McDavid, as mentioned, did get a goal. Two assists for him as well. So three points. He is up to 29 points in 13 playoff games so far. These playoffs. Derek Ryan also getting on the score sheet for the Oilers. As that was when you kind of started looking around going, oh. There might be a chance here. And then Ryan Nugent Hopkins as the Oilers came oh so close to tying the game. But Nuge does get on the score sheet as well. One goal and an assist for Nuge as well. Two points for 
Nuge. I was going to call him the kid, but you know, you know, he, he's, he hasn't changed really, but he, he's not exactly a kid anymore. So the good for the Oilers in game one, a gutsy performance, plus a little bit of secondary scoring goals from all four lines. That's what you need to win hockey games. I know they didn't, but that's what you need in the future. The bad for the Edmonton Oilers as well. Yes, they did get six goals and goals from all four lines, but they allowed eight. That is the bad for the Edmonton Oilers. You can't allow eight goals. You can't allow that touchdown and two-point conversion. As Mike Smith said, you're not going to win games by allowing a touchdown. I mean, there's not much else that needs to be said. Don't allow eight goals. That is the bad for game one for the Edmonton Oilers. And let's get to the ugly. <sighs> I told you I was going to save it for the end here. The ugly from game one is that offside call. Yeah. That offside call in game one of the Western Conference Finals on Kale McCarr's third goal at the end of the first period for the Colorado Avalanche was the single worst call in NHL Stanley Cup history. It was. It was. In playoff history. Now, I understand a lot of people are going, well, he wasn't touching the puck, so it wasn't possession. <sighs> Possession is nine-tenths of the law. Kale McCarr had nine-tenths of the possession of that puck. In fact, Kale McCarr had possession of that puck since before the face-off dot. In fact... Kale McCarr had so much possession of that puck that he was able to take almost four strides with the puck before that puck went into the zone. So you're going to tell me genuinely from the genuine, genuine unbiased position that Kale McCarr did not have possession of the puck going into the offensive zone? Are you kidding me? I don't care if he pushed that puck two feet ahead of him. He had possession of the puck as nobody, nobody in a white jersey was anywhere any freaking close to Kale McCarr. Nobody. The closest oiler to Kale McCarr on that play was Mike Smith. Is Mike Smith now all of a sudden in possession of the puck? You're telling me that he has the wherewithal in his head to somehow realize that, oh, okay, he's offside. I might as well, ooh, I don't have possession of it. I'm not touching it. I'm not touching it. Are you kidding me? You're telling me that you know, as a referee, the intention of Kale McCarr coming across the line. Is that what you're telling me? <laughs> Is that what you're telling me? Because you could see it. You could see it. He, he is a good foot and a half offside. So then what, what, what's the definition of possession? You got to have it on your stick at all times. So even when you're stick handling and you come off the puck for a second, that's not possession? Every, every moment that it's on somebody's stick, that's possession, right? Or is it just when you have the puck under control? This is a serious issue that the NHL needs to go over. Because what's the definition of possession? What are you going to define as possession? So then does that mean if he gets hit, that's interference because he doesn't have possession of the puck? What are we doing here? This is game one of the Western Conference Finals. In the Stanley Cup playoffs. And you sit there and make that call? What are we doing here? The NBA has a system in place that keeps their officials accountable. 
the MLB is this close from being an automated ref league or officiated league, umpired league. Every other league in North America has done something to fix their officiating. The NHL has done absolutely nothing. And it affects the game. It affects the game. And you you then go and turn around and play how many betting ads and expect the people to, that are watching this game to bet on your product? When they don't even know the rules of the game, apparently? NHL, you got to be better. You got to be better. Well, you got to be better heading into game two, as that is the same tune that the Edmonton Oilers need to be facing as well as the Colorado Avalanche head into game two on Thursday with a one nothing series lead over the Edmonton Oilers. Game two will go at 6 p.m., on Thursday. That is where we're going to call it today. Thank you so much for making Locked On Oilers your first listen every day. Now for your second listen, make sure you tune in to Locked On NHL. Locked On NHL covers the playoffs like no other. Hear the latest news and opinions from local experts every Monday through Friday. It is free and available wherever you find your podcasts. <sighs> Oil Country. Take a breath. Let's regroup. Puck drop goes tomorrow, as we mentioned, at 6 o'clock in Denver. Make sure you're watching that game, everybody. It's going to be fantastic. And hopefully the Edmonton Oilers will come away with the split. On tomorrow's episode, we're going to talk a little bit more about Zach Hyman and just what exactly he does for the Edmonton Oilers. And plus, let's get a little bit more positive on tomorrow's episode. What else can the Oilers do well and really work on for game two? And what did the Oilers do well? We will get more into that on tomorrow's episode. But for now, I hope you guys have a wonderful, wonderful Wednesday, and I hope you stay safe.